Let me introduce uh, Dr. Chernock. Uh, he's currently Chief Science Officer at Trevini Digital. Previously, he was research staff member at IBM Research investigating digital broadcast technologies. Mr. Chernock, Dr. Chernock, excuse me, is chairman of the ATSC Technology Group on ATSC 3.0 and chairs the ad hoc group on service delivery and synchronization. He was previously chairman of the ATSC Technology and Standards Group, TG1. He is also a distinguished lecture, lecturer chair for IEEE BTS and a member of FOBTV. In another life far away, he used transmission electronic micro, microscopy <laughs> to study materials, characteristics for advanced ceramic packaging and semiconductor technology at IBM. His doctorate in science was from MIT in the field of nuclear materials engineering. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Charles. <laughs> Thank you. I keep that in there because nobody can say it. Okay, so I'm going to tell you all about ATSC 3.0. ATSC 3.0 is a very complicated system. Uh, there are 21 documents as part of the standard suite. I don't have time to go into depth in all of them. Uh, it'll take about two weeks. So I'm trying to, going to try to give you a broad brush, a view of what's going on at different layers, what the capabilities are, what some of the new features are. Um, probably best if we try to hold questions till the end. Uh, so let me proceed. Before I do, um, I have to give my promo as well. Um, so it's the uh, IEEE Broadcast Technology Society that is actually paying my way here. Uh, BTS, yeah. Same message, get involved. Uh, if you're interested in broadcasting technology, uh, IEEE is a very well-known, very widespread, and actually almost ancient society. Uh, I forgot the exact date, but I think it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, BTS is focused on broadcasting technologies, virtually all kinds. Uh, we have a program called the Distinguished Lecturer Program that We've got lecturers identified all over the world, experts in different areas, and the society pays their travel expenses so they can visit different chapters and functions and spread their knowledge worldwide. Uh, these are our current crop of lecturers. Uh, some of the topics that they are talking about in different places and the places where they reside. So we do have worldwide coverage. Uh, so please consider joining IEEE and the Broadcast Technology Society. And if you happen to be on the West Coast in a West Coast, East Coast in a couple of weeks in the DC area, the IEEE Broadcast Symposium is taking place. So let me go on to ATSC 3.0. Um, I'm going to give an overview of uh, a little bit about what ATSC is, overview of 3.0 go into the technologies and talk about the status. So first, ATSC. Uh, ATSC has been around since 1983. It was founded by what is now CTA, IEEE, NAB, NCTA, and SMPT. Its focus is on terrestrial digital television broadcasting. Uh, it's an open due process organization. We have about 140 members. Uh, from really all categories, broadcasters, equipment manufacturers, cable and satellite, consumer electronics, semiconductor manufacturers, universities. Um, participants and contributors are worldwide. Uh, there are elements of ATSC 3.0 that come from virtually all over the world. Uh, this is I'm not sure it's completely up to date, but this is a view of our members. You probably will recognize many of the logos up there. So let me go into ATSC 3.0. Uh, ATSC 1.0, um, which actually only recently got called that. It used to be ATSC standards. Uh, when we started doing 2.0 and 3.0, we figured we had to give a number to the first one, so it became 1.0. Uh, it was all about high-definition video, uh, multicasting. It's 
surround sound, electronic program guides, all very advanced stuff when it was being done. <clears throat> in 1995, this was revolutionary. But if you look at what the technologies were that were in use at that time, you had you know, TVs that looked like that. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, you know, TVs, PC was this. Um, they had cell phones, and they had these great displays that showed numbers. <laughs> In those days, this is fine. Uh, HD TV to a large screen, that's great. The idea of mobile video just didn't exist back then, so it was not part of the target. Uh, today, things have changed, and it changes quicker and quicker. Smart TVs, flat screens, me. The uh, video, the old Dick Tracy watch is real. Uh, make phone calls on your watch, watch television on your watch, so on and so forth. Uh, smartphones, everybody carries around computers that are capable of HD video. Uh, PCs have changed, tablets, the notion of tablets didn't even exist back when we were dealing with TSC1. Uh, so the demands of the consumers are constantly changing. Um, over-the-air viewing, broadcast television viewing via an antenna, is growing again. It is steadily growing. Some of it's cord cutting. Some of it, uh, there's been some interesting articles recently about millennials discovering that if they get this cheap antenna and hook it up to their TV, they can actually watch television. <laughs> and it's free. <laughs> so, it's kind of interesting. Um, mobile viewing. People want to do this more and more. Uh, cord cutting, uh, changing the dynamics, on demand is assumed, digital advertising has become a big part of the picture. Uh, the web has taught advertisers certain things. They'd like to be able to do that in broadcast television. Well, today they can. Uh, targeted advertising is essential. Um, one of the key revenue differences with cable and broadcast had been that cable systems can target ads. They could target to a neighborhood, a hub. Uh, and broadcast television, <coughs> what came out of the antenna was common to everybody who was receiving it. Uh, in 3.0, we've leapfrogged that. And it's actually gonna be possible to target advertising to the individual household. Uh, and consumers, you know, it used to be the classic Joe six-pack, sit back on the couch, a beer in hand, sports on the TV, and sit there passive. Uh, consumers have become used to being a little bit more active with an entertainment. They still want to do, to be entertained and sit back, but they're becoming used to doing things along with their television. Uh, so 3.0 is really, there's a lot of consumer-driven features here, and if you don't design a new system to match what the users desire, you probably aren't going to do very well. So there's a lot of focus on use cases, what people would want to do with broadcast television. So there's an increasing demand for higher resolution images and better sound. Um, and the technology keeps on improving. There's been major improvements in video and audio codecs since ATSC1 came around. Uh, in the broadcast world, spectrum is becoming increasingly scarce. You know, we had the auction, there's a repack going on. Some of what was the broadcast spectrum is going to the cell companies. This means that you gotta be able to do better with the decreasing spectrum that you have available for broadcast. Uh, other paths than broadcast have become, become commonplace. OTT, streaming, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu. People are used to this. Uh, they're competing with broadcast. A number of years ago, broadcast was the thing for entertain video entertainment. No longer. It's not the only thing anymore. Uh, and better audience measurement accuracy is really desired. Today, it's a statistical approach. It's a bit of a shotgun approach. Uh, it is not that granular. Um, advertisers expect more. The web has taught them they can get different information, deeper information. And broadcasters want to be able to deliver this. This is a money thing. 
So the goals of ATSC 3.0, improve television viewing experience, add value to the service platform, extend the reach, allow for new business models, provide better quality audio and video, uh, more accessibility, be able to personalize and give interactivity, things that people are becoming accustomed to. And to do it in such a way that you can address changing consumer behavior and preferences. We've learned that what people want to do changes with time. As things become available, they change how they want to do things, how they want to consume video. And adaptability and evolvability to match the changes is really required. Putting a system in place and saying, this is good, it's going to last 20 years, I don't have to do anything, those days are gone. You have to be able to evolve like the internet does. So with all this in mind, we sort of sat down, created some requirements, went to work, came up with something, and it looked sort of like this. <laughs> and if you start looking at some of these standards, you get a feeling it's like that. Uh, the surprise, this is an entire next generation TV system, all the way from the physical RF layer, all the way through the coding and interactivity. Um, <coughs> it's complicated. It took three, three and a half years. We're nearly done now. And we did all of this in about three and a half years, which is amazingly fast for something as complex as what was done. So I really have to give credit to all the people that were involved that did all this work. So benefits to the consumer, maintain competitive top tier picture and sound quality, uh, reach new devices, you know, we have devices today we didn't have in the past. I think we're going to have devices in the near future that nobody has thought of yet. Uh, they come out of the woodwork. We have to be adaptable to be able to reach these. Um, leverage the power of broadcasting. Broadcasting is great if you have the same content to go to lots and lots of people. Um, doesn't matter how many receivers there are. If you broadcast something, 10 people, thousand people, a million people, hundred million people, if they can receive the signal, it's the same broadcast. Uh, but there's the internet. Internet is good for other things. Things that are more personalized, things that are more user view, uh, point to point. Being able to combine these, make use of advantages or capabilities of both is really important and that was part of the goal of 3.0. Uh, flexibility, efficient use of the spectrum, and the spectrum is decreasing. So be able to do it better. More bits per hertz, uh, more choices in robustness, whether you reach distance, whether you carry a lot of bits, whether you handle mobile conditions. Broadcasters need all these options. Uh, new technology. Uh, technology's moved on. In the work that we did on ATSC3, we're using things that five years ago were nobody even thought of. Uh, and then a goal we didn't quite hit it, but we're getting closer each time, trying to reach a, a standard that might be adoptable around the world. At some point in the future, I'm hoping that you can get on a plane with a, your device, get off somewhere, anywhere in the world, turn it on, and you can get TV. We're not quite there, but we're closer to it than we were in the past. Uh, so requirements, flexibility, robust transmission, more bits per channel, bigger capacity, the ability to trade off capacity for robustness depending on what the broadcaster wants to achieve. Uh, mobile is part of the system. It's not an add-on. It's not a me too. It's an integral core part of the broadcast system. Uh, using the most advanced audio video coding systems that exist. Uh, UHD video, immersive and personalized audio. It's kind of funny when people talk about digital television, compression, everybody focuses on video because that's the sexy part. Turns out I think the audio is the more important part. Um, I think we should focus on that more. <laughs> and just, you know, as an example, if you're watching television and it pixelates, there's these little blocks show up, so what? If the audio glitches, everybody just looks up. So it's, audio is really an important thing to viewers. And then future. We learned that things don't stop changing. They keep on evolving. Uh, so we've worked out ways to make this new standard extensible, 
and scalable. We can actually bring in new technologies coexisting with the old technologies and gracefully evolve them all the way down to the physical RF layer. We can actually send a mixture of old and new technologies and receivers will do what they understand. <clears throat> so we finally learned some lessons from the past. So elevator pitch, what we've created is the next gen broadcast television system, higher data, flexible spectrum, more robustness, extensibility, mobile and handheld is a core part, hybrid broadcast and broadband, advanced audio video compression, uh, immersive audio, UHD video, interactivity, personalization, new business models, and a path to the future. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go into some of the details of how this is actually done and so on. Uh, and I've got some little videos scattered throughout. Somebody who knows PowerPoint better than me did this for me, but uh, they, they help. So this first one is just an overview of ATSC 3.0. Television broadcasters are leading the way with a new system that will merge the capabilities of over-the-air broadcasting with the internet. Two decades ago, the Advanced Television Systems Committee celebrated the FCC's adoption of the first all-digital over-the-air TV standard. It offered pristine, high-definition video delivered in the same 6 MHz channel once needed for black and white, and then color TV. Now broadcasters are evolving to meet the needs of today's viewers and advertisers. This next generation broadcast platform merges the best capabilities of over the air and broadband viewing. The result is a convergence of the most popular method of watching live events with the variety of programming available online. ATSC 3.0 is designed from the ground up to be all of those things. A next generation transmission system that can deliver 4K Ultra HD images with high dynamic range, plus interactive features and multi-channel immersive audio. ATSC 3.0 is the world's first broadcast standard built on an internet protocol backbone. This offers the advantage of both broadcast and broadband. Designed to integrate with internet delivered content, ATSC 3.0 will present viewers with more streams, more choices, more channels, and more flexibility. The system takes advantage of new technology with advanced video and audio compression and more robust modulation. Responding to the needs of broadcasters, this new broadcast platform is exceptionally robust. Adaptable for single frequency network transmission systems that can overcome physical challenges to deliver TV deep inside buildings and on the go. The result is better indoor reception and wide coverage for mobile devices. ATSC 3.0's advanced emergency alerting is designed to wake up sleeping devices, alert families of impending emergencies, and provide a rich variety of video, text, audio, and graphic information when it's needed most. New audience measurement tools come with ATSC 3.0. And the new system can also be a pipeline for delivering data to the car, to mobile devices, and to the home. ATSC 3.0 is built for a variety of receiving devices too. New gateway receivers will deliver over-the-air TV to existing tablets and smart TVs through Wi-Fi. Mobile devices and TV sets equipped with ATSC 3.0 receivers will make TV available virtually anywhere. That's all great news for viewers, and we'll find it easier than ever to tune in to live TV broadcasts anywhere, anytime. For advertisers, ATSC 3.0's advanced advertising features include interactive and ad-targeting capabilities in real time to the viewer. Best of all, ATSC 3.0 is designed from the ground up with a suite of standards that can be updated in the future. ATSC 3.0 a new broadcast platform that is flexible, adaptable, and focused on the future today. Okay. Uh, now a little bit more detail. So, this is the organization. Just the uh, reason for putting it together is we broke all the work up into different layers. You know, it's a layered system, just like all these things are. It just made sense to get the experts together that understood RF, let them work on their part. Uh, the bits and bytes and plumbing, stuff I think is fun. 
Uh, so we had physical layer management and protocols, applications and presentation, and then an initial group that worked on requirements and the like. After working on this for a while, we started to realize that this is not simple broadcast television only. There's internet connectivity, there's broadband, there's potentially money making things happening. Uh, security was an important aspect. So we formed a new specialist group to deal with security. Ah, that's an interesting bit of work. Uh, and then later on figured there's also a lot of work going on where broadcasters give send content to cable satellite folks for redistribution. They are all probably going in the same direction as far as technology, but at different rates. So there's going to be a period of time where ATSC3 stuff needs to be converted to the old stuff for carriage. Uh, so we formed a specialist group to work on that that involves cable guys, satellite guys, and broadcasters. So this is the makeup of the ATSC TG3 committee uh, and gives you an idea of the different layers and roughly speaking the standards all fall within one of these layers. Protocol stack, and I'm not going to go into gory detail, but it's complicated. There's lots of stuff going on. Uh, you'll note there's a broadband column and a broadcast column. This is a hybrid system. Things can be sent over broadcast or broadband and combined. Uh, there's a lot of similarities intentionally in what goes on in broadcast and broadband. It's a lot easier to make things work with two different carriage mechanisms if they're using the same mechanisms. Um, so physical layer, which I'll talk about in a bit, then we get into transport. Key point is this is all internet protocol based transport. MPEG-2 transport is not part of the picture anymore. Uh, and that's one of the things that makes life easy. Broadband has always been IP. Broadcast is now IP. Combining two IP things and synchronizing them is much simpler than an IP thing in an MPEG-2 transport thing, which is being tried elsewhere in the world. And maybe they're succeeding, but it's a lot of work. Uh, you get into some familiar things, HTTP, uh, this stuff's a little bit unique to broadcast. Uh, and then I'll get into a little bit more detail, but it's starting to look an awful lot like the streaming world, the OTT world, what Netflix and Amazon Prime use. And then applications up above. So I'll go layer by layer. Physical layer, the RF modulation. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. This is all OFDM based. So that's a key, another key change from the previous ATSC system, which was 8VSB. Um, shows an OFDM uh, with, let me try to remember. Yeah, I think I do that. Uh, I'm going to get into the bootstrap in a second. But there's been a lot of work, a lot of advances on modulation, encoding, waveforms, error correction, uh, things that either get you more bits per hertz or get you more robustness. This curve on the right, um, do, do people know what Shannon's limit is? Yeah. Some do, okay. So this is a guy named Claude Shannon. Um, and if he hadn't come around and somebody else didn't do it, we'd be way back. Uh, it's a lot of signal processing theory, a lot of communications theory. One of his things, observations, was that for a noisy channel, there's a limit to how much information you can get through there. That's the blue line. And this x-axis is essentially noise, signal to noise ratio. The blue line shows how much information you can get across a channel without amount of noise. Until somebody figures out how to cheat physics or cheat Shannon, that blue line is the limit to what you can carry. So if you pick say 10 dB signal to noise, you go up to the blue curve, you go across, this will tell you how many bits you can get into that channel or bits per hertz. The closer you can get to that blue line, the better you're doing as far as broadcast efficiency. 
the system we're using today, ATSC 1.0, 853 is the standard, is a single point sitting out here. These red points are what's been achieved with ATSC 3.0. It's the closest system to the Shannon limit that exists today. Uh, DVB-T2 is close, but it's a little bit further away. And we're also at the point of diminishing returns. Um, Shannon limits theoretical. Any real world system actually has some losses, so you can never get to the Shannon limit. The ATSC 3 curve is very close to what you can possibly achieve. Another point to note is ATSC 1 is a single operating point. Um, 15 dB, signal and noise, antenna 30 feet off the ground, so on and so forth. Back then, there were no mobile devices. The target was to an antenna on the roof, get as many bits as you can to a fixed receiver in the house with HD. Today, you may want to get as many bits as you can, and I think <laughs> ATSC 3 might be able to get up to about 50 megabits per second in a 6 megahertz channel. 50, 60, but that's ideal conditions. Uh, so if you want lots of bits, you can get lots of bits. If you want robust, if you want to hit things that are moving or deep underground, you can crank up the error correction, drop the capacity, but now reach things that you couldn't reach before. And I've seen ATSC3 early demonstrations where one six megahertz channel carried a 4K, video, carried a standard definition, no, sorry, in HD, and it carried a standard definition with different degrees of robustness. The SD was received in the third sub-basement of a building in Cleveland where my cell phone said, you got to be kidding me, there's no signal, and we're watching television. So there's a lot of choice for the broadcaster. Besides having the choice, the broadcaster is also able to operate in different operating conditions at the same time. I'll get into that in a second. But a broadcaster who wants to do UHD, their quality is their prime focus, can operate up here. One who wants to do mobile, add robustness, can operate down here. Someone who isn't sure and wants to do both can operate in both. They obviously have to split the six megahertz channel, but they don't have to limit themselves to only one operating condition. Ah. <coughs> A new thing in ATSC 3.0, and this is actually new around the world, is there's a little oh, wow. piece of the physical layer, the RF transmission, called the bootstrap. It's, and this is very odd, uh, ATSC 3 was designed for 6, 7, and 8 megahertz channels. It can do more, it's just they've done the optimization for that. The bootstrap is a very small piece at 5 megahertz, and it's the starting oh. point for any receiver. It's extremely robust. It can be received at minus six dB signal to noise ratio. And for those that aren't into the physical layer, that means that your signal is six dB below the noise floor. So you could probably receive this in the tunnel under the Baltimore Harbor. Um, <coughs> what it carries, it's not very efficient because it's extremely robust, but what it carries is information needed to start the reception. It says, I'm ATSC 3.0. This is the kind of stuff you're going to find in the physical layer frames that follow. And this is the time until the next similar physical layer frame. What that means is that I could send ATSC 3.0 in this frame. The next frame, if I come up with new technology, I can send ATSC 3.1, a new physical layer technology. And a receiver will look at this and go, okay, I understand 3.0, but I don't understand 3.1. But it's telling me this frame is 3.0, and the next 3.0 frame comes over here. So it decodes this, waits a while, decodes the next one. So you can start evolving your broadcast to new technologies, and old receivers will keep on working. Uh, another thing that's in here is here. There are two bits in there that serve as emergency alert wake-up. Receivers that are sleeping, 
You know, very few receivers are off these days. They go into standby mode. Uh, they can wake up periodically, look at the bootstrap, and go back to sleep. If these bits are flipped, it tells the receiver there's something really important going on. Wake up, process the signal, and get the emergency information. So this can have a situation where your TV on the wall, your portable device, if there's an earthquake, it'll wake up and start telling you about it without you having to do anything. It's a, I think it's a really important feature. Uh, there's something called physical layer pipes. We have a six megahertz channel. We don't have to use the entire channel for the same characteristics. I can break it up into different pipes and have different levels of robustness. And of course, there is a capacity trade-off. The more robust things are, the less you can put through the pipe. Uh, and this is selections of modulation, coding, error correction, and things like that. You can do things like put uh, one interesting example is analog television. If the signal started to get weak, the video would break up, but the audio would keep on playing. And eventually the audio would kind of die out. But if you had fading conditions, you're moving, whatever, you, the audio would continue. Well, digital television is a clip effect. You either got it perfectly or you didn't get anything. Uh, you could, if you want, put audio on a more robust pipe. If you want to replicate that kind of condition, you can put audio, you can put captions on a more robust pipe. And the more bandwidth intensive stuff, you put it on a less robust pipe. That way, if there's fading, the audio can continue playing. So there's different models that can be used. Uh, there's lots of options, uh, PLPs. There's lots of knobs you can turn at the physical layer. Uh, you can have up to 64 active PLPs in one RF channel. I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense, but you could. Uh, a service is limited to four PLPs just because it takes resources in the receiver to deal with more than one. So we limited it to four. There's another new technology called layer division multiplexing, which took me a long time to figure out, uh, especially because it was first named cloud multiplexing. Um, and there's a strange reason for that. This again is new technology. ATSC3 is the first to have it. Essentially, you have two different layers of uh, characteristics that are overlaid. So you're essentially doing power multiplexing. You have a more robust layer and a less robust. The less robust carries more bits. The more robust is receivable everywhere. Receiver will look at this, it'll see the more robust layer, receive it, decode it, take the information out, recreate the robust layer, and then subtract it from the received signal, which then exposes the next layer down. If the signal is good enough that it can decode that, it'll then process that and decode it. Well, why do you want to do this? You know, it sounds kind of complicated. Uh, you might want to do it if you want to send both fixed. Well, actually, I've got an example. Let me hold that for a second. Um, if nothing else, it makes for some really neat looking constellations. Um, and when I started doing this stuff, I was a physical area, I, not physical, transport layer. I dealt with bits and bytes, and this was all pure magic to me. And I had to basically sit down with people, experts, and they kept on beating it into my brain until it made sense. Uh, but these constellations, this is kind of a view of these are the points where the data is being carried, where the symbols are. Um, one thing that you might note, it may not mean much, but usually when you look at constellation patterns, there are these nice rectangular patterns. ATSC3 is using non-uniform constellations. And for certain, um, for the higher data capacity, you can actually get a few dB gain in efficiency by going to non-uniform constellations. What you see up here is actually layers. There's a, probably a QPSK, which is like a four, four by four type pattern. 
and a higher uh, 256 Huang laid on top of it as the more uh, less robust. And you add them together, you get this kind of multiple, the uh, Huang pattern is replicated and so on and so forth. Uh, why would you want to do this? So an example is a broadcaster that wants to deliver mobile and fixed of the same content. You could send an HD stream and a UHD stream, and you could use different PLPs, uh, one high robust, one less robust, more bandwidth. Uh, it turns out if you use the layer division multiplexing, you actually get a few dB gain. So you get more information through the channel than you would if you used pure physical air pipes. And something I'll get into a little bit later, the video encoding is using uh, something in HEVC called SHVC, scalable video coding. So you can send, you can take a UHD sig, uh, video, encode it in an SHVC encoder, get a base layer, which is HD. You put that into any receiver that speaks HEVC, it'll decode HD. There's also an enhancement layer. The enhancement layer is the in extra information that takes it up to UHD, to 4K. Okay, so you take the HD, you put it into the high robust mobile, and a moving receiver that's gonna have poor reception conditions is gonna receive this, be able to display HD. A fixed receiver that has better reception is going to be able to pick up the low robustness layer, get the enhancement layer, add them together, and recreate UHD. If you do it this way, it takes less bits to carry the UHD signal and the HD signal than it does if you sent separate streams. So by mixing these two technologies, a broadcaster has the option of serving both um, <clears throat> serving both mobile devices with HD and fixed devices with UHD. <coughs> the other thing, single frequency networks. When you are sending broadcast RF information, what really matters is how much energy can you hit the antenna with. Certain things happen. If you're deep indoors, you have stuff blocking the signal. If you have terrain, you know, hills around here, uh, if there's a big hill between you and the antenna and you can't see the antenna, you're not going to get much signal. Broadcasting isn't going to work all that well. If you're able to put up other antennas to sort of blanket the area, if you're trying to cover indoors to get different directions, if you're trying to get around hills, this all gives you coverage on the terrain. The problem is that if you try to do this using the same frequency on the broadcast without some magic involved, you end up worse than you would have been. Uh, signals cancel in certain areas, you have propagation problems. If you don't do some special things, you end up with uh, very weird characteristics and very weird coverage. OFDM, the way it's built, there's something called a guard interval, where essentially a portion of the initial waveform is replicated at the end. If you have that, and you are able to emit the symbols at exactly the same time from each of the antennas, you can get around all these problems of cancellation and nulling and so on. The problems fall into the guard interval which is an area that you're discarding anyways. You lose a little bit of capacity because of the guard interval, but you have the ability to actually emit from different antennas the same signal, and a receiver will just pick it up. It's not seeing null problems, it's not getting confused, it's just getting a signal. Uh, single frequency networks are really, really important for a lot of things. ATSC-1 technology, it was possible to do it, it was hard. By using OFDM, I'm not going to say it's trivial, but it's much, much easier. So this is a core part of ATSC 3.0, and the guard interval in the OFDM takes care of the inner symbol interference. 
Uh, there's actually some interesting tricks in magic. Uh, it's normally thought that when you're dealing single frequency networks, everything has to be exactly the same. It turns out with layer division multiplexing, you can actually have different stuff coming out of each antenna at the right layers. There's ways of actually identifying where things come from, and it doesn't get things confused, which I still don't understand completely, but it works. Uh, so physical layer itself, you know, I sort of gla uh, glazed over a lot of it. There are a lot of knobs. Um, a lot of things that you can do, a lot of controls the broadcaster has, choices in bid interleaving, what kind of non-uniform constellations, the pipes that you use, are you doing time, multiplex and frequency, or layer. Um, my so and my mo, multiple input, multiple output, are all capabilities of the system. Not likely to be used for a while because it's really hard to do and it's hard on the receiver, but the capabilities are there for the future when the technology actually allows it to be built. Single frequency networks, channel bonding. Uh, you can take multiple six megahertz channels if the broadcaster has access to them and the receiver has multiple tuners, you can bond them together and make them look like a 12 megahertz or an 18 megahertz channel, and they don't have to be adjacent. That's all part of the design of the system. Uh, so there's a huge amount of stuff. The physical layer is extremely complex. Uh, so it basically meets the needs of the broadcaster. Lots of flexibility. Uh, choices in service offerings, coverage areas. The broadcaster now can do a lot of different things and it all depends on what business they want to do. Uh, robustness, lots of bits, better reception, all choices of the broadcaster, and evolution. Physical air can evolve over time. Okay, so I think there's another video. We think the power of this standard is incredible, but there's new ad inventory, context-based ads. If you drive to work the same route every day, how would you know McDonald's opened up two blocks from your path? Maybe you would eat there once a week if you only knew it was there, right? So you drive by it, here's the McDonald's ad. Press the ad, it'll show you how to get to it. New inventory for local broadcasting, new business, new revenue. It's sort of the connection of the broadcaster to the local community is one of the key benefits of television broadcast. ATSC 3 and they all kinds of new things to come out, you know, that are particularly good at that function and that role for the local broadcaster. That's the physical layer. And as I said, this, well, I think A321 and 322 are probably about 200 pages, the standards themselves. It's very complicated. Moving up into things I'm more comfortable with, the management layer. Uh, this is really the metadata, service guides, uh, transport, how do I carry audio and video, how do I get them associated, uh, how do I get things synchronized, you know, lip sync, we'd like that to be in the past. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Well, let's seek errors. We want it to be in the past. <laughs> uh, interactive services, companion screens. Uh, that's an interesting one. When we started this, companion screens were a big deal. Everybody's saying people are using these other screens while they're watching TV. And then after a while, they noticed that what they were doing on the screen had nothing to do with TV. So it's not quite as interesting, but it may pick back up again. But there's full support for it. Uh, also, some... Slightly odd things. Uh, a lot of broadcast television is carried by MVPDs, cable, satellite, and so on. And what actually hits the brand new advanced television is decoded by the cable box. So broadcaster has all this fancy stuff in there and HDMI hits the TV. It's actually possible to identify and put information metadata in using watermarking to let the TV know what the broadcaster was intending and have this interactivity work. Of course, this is in conjunction in agreement with the cable operators and so on. But it's an interesting technology. 
So, big thing. Uh, ATSC-1 was MPEG-2 transport. Virtually all the other systems in use around the world are MPEG-2 transport. ATSC-3.0 has moved on. ATSC 3.0 uses IP transport exclusively for both streaming and for file content. Uh, it's a game changer. It allows hybrid. It allows a lot of new things that you couldn't do with MPEG-2 transport. There's a few other elements. They sound kind of simple. So use of IP. This is probably one of the big game changers for ATSC 3.0. Uh, this one, it's hard to figure out what that really means, but uh, for streaming content, we're using ISO-based media file format. So instead of sending streams of audio and video, like we've done in the past, we are sending chunks of files, segments. If you think about how Netflix delivers over the internet, Amazon Prime, Hulu, uh, it's dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP. Uh, it's sending segments, files, and a playlist. And the playlist says, play this one, play that one, play that one. And in the case of Netflix and things like that, this is internet connected. The speed, the robustness, the delivery of the connection may vary with time. So that's the dynamic adaptive. Your player looks at it and says, you know, I almost didn't get that segment in time. So let me ask for a lower resolution segment next time. It'll play continuously. So it's playing one piece after another piece, and it may choose different representations. <clears throat> if you forget about the dynamic adaptive, because broadcast is deterministic, you know, you're going to get the same thing. Uh, it uses the same mechanism. It uses segments of files. Sounds simple. Huge ramifications. So... One of the holy grails of television has been the ability to personalize ads. There's a lot of money involved with that. Ads are usually annoying to people. But if you're in the market for, say, a truck, you want to buy a pickup truck, and you start seeing ads for pickup trucks because your TV knows, maybe you told it, that you're interested in pickup trucks, you might pay attention. You might like the ads. Advertisers throw like this. The guy next door is looking for a sports car. He doesn't want to see pickup trucks. He wants to see the sport, sports cars. His TV knows that. He gets those ads. <clears throat> In today's system, MPEG-2 transport, splicing things, changing a piece of content on the fly is really hard. Jim knows all about that. <laughs> it can be done, but it can't be done in a television set that people can afford and bring home. It takes thousands of dollars worth of fancy equipment to get it right. There's lots of timing issues with lots of buffer issues. <clears throat> if you go to ISO BMFF, segmented file delivery, you're following a playlist. You're always playing one thing after another. If you simply change the playlist, and instead of playing this one, you play that one, you've just spliced. So it went from being really hard, really expensive, really complicated, to trivial. That is a big thing. Now ads, you know, it's probably the most pra uh, realistic example. There's going to be lots of others. Uh, another thing is the old system used a timing model where the encoder clock was replicated in the receiver. And that was encoder by encoder. So if I had different virtual channels, different programs, each one had their own timeline. That's great. Works perfectly fine. It's worked for decades with um, MPEG-2, today's digital television. If you start trying to combine things that come from different sources over different paths, that falls apart really quickly. It's really, really hard to do. If instead you switch to UTC, where everything in the system knows what time it is. And it's all based on essentially GPS time or UTC, Universal Coordinated Time. If everything knows what time it is, then it's easy to synchronize, no matter what path it takes, no matter where it comes from. It's one time. <clears throat> These are the key changes that were made in ATSC 3 as far as transport. 
then again, they sound simple, but huge ramifications in the capabilities and what you're able to do. Uh, so IP transport, when we first started going, television was really an independent silo, didn't need to communicate with anything. Now, you can start thinking of it as part of the internet, a broadcast part of the internet. Uh, broadcast, broadband, or peer delivery mechanisms. You can incorporate niche content. And one example of where, you know, a simple example where this might make sense is if you have a television program and you have a large part of the audience that speaks English, a large part that speaks Spanish. You can put two audio languages in. That's simple. But let's say you have a diverse, you know, like around here, you've got lots of languages and significant numbers of people that speak them. If you had the ability to have all these languages available, or at least a subset of them available, viewers would appreciate that. If you take the popular ones, popular is not the right word, the most common ones, put them in broadcast where it costs, bits cost, and you make the other ones available over broadband. That way, if someone who speaks uh, Hmong, for example, wants to watch and you've got it available, their TV knows that's their preference for language and it brings in the audio over broadband, combines it with the broadcast video. Everything lines up, everything works perfectly. These are things you couldn't do before. Uh, new business models, ad insertion, addressable advertising, uh, things in that order. This is, you know, it's simple to say, but it's a big deal. Uh, and to highlight that, who is this? Paul Hardy, I think, is going to talk about this. Free dot O, we believe, is it's the future of the broadcast business, and of course, we are in the broadcast business. <coughs> Addressable advertising for broadcasters means a potential increase in revenue because the, the ads that are delivered to the viewers are more suitable to their interests and likely purchases. Addressable advertising works by creating a better match between the advertising content and the individual or group of viewers. But this offers you the opportunity to do is to tailor it more finely, to make it match viewer preferences, to make it match uh, what the viewers are prepared to share with you about their viewing patterns, etc. So moving out of transport, there's a lot more in there. Um, A331, which is the transport standard, which we just approved today, this morning, for <laughs> reballot. It's going to the final. Uh, it's probably about 200 pages long itself. Uh, quite complicated. Uh, applications layer, video coding, audio, presentation logic, interactivity. Uh, again, repeating it because I think it's important. Uh, hybrid deliveries is a core part of ATSC3. Uh, a couple of other things. Um, you know, I mentioned the video, the audio of alternate language. Um, I mean, if you think about ad insertion, well, where are you going to get these alternate ads? They are most, most likely to come across broadband. It's hard to kind of fit them into broadcast. Uh, and a notion people have been playing around with is um, handoff from broadcast to broadband if the reception fades. Have that available. I'm not sure if it's, anybody's going to do that, but it's a possibility. Service models. Um, things don't have to remain static. So over time, you could have a television program, which is video, audio, captions, uh, an alternate caption track, alternate languages, interactivity. Next one, simpler video, audio, captions. Uh, you could have a applications, interactivity associated. You could have a program later on which has multiple videos. Uh, we relaxed the restriction of one video only, and ATSC3 supports multiple videos, multi views, composite type things, whatever you can dream up, uh, multiple audios, and so on. Uh, and you can have these things delivered, some of them over broadcast, some of them over broadband. Uh, audience measurement, well, most TVs these days will have a return channel. Uh, ATSC3 will take, make use of that. It doesn't require it. Television will still work in a one-way system, just like it always has, but certain capabilities may not work. 
uh, audience measurement, well, it's not going to work very well if you don't have a return channel. Uh, but there's enough in there to allow broadcasters to gather information that's much more granular and of much more interest to them and their advertisers. Of course, they still have to figure out what to do with it because it's lots of data and most broadcasters haven't gone there yet. But the capabilities exist. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, if you're redistributing over cable or satellite uh, using watermarks, it's possible to identify what the content is, what the source is, and where along that you are, and be able to reach out to serve broadcaster server to get interactive components to go with it. And one more video. time first party data that comes to the to the broadcaster and it provides whatever information that we are allowed to collect from the from the television sets the watermark is embedded at the broadcast signal then you have detectors who pick those up on multi platforms who then passes that on to the to the internet and then the information comes back to enhance the content and get measurement information the data is, is an advantage to the broadcaster, who then makes it work for the consumer. All these videos were taken during NAB this year. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a ATSC hub, I forget exactly what we called it, uh, showing off a lot of the capabilities. Uh, video. So ATSC3 video is utilizing HEVC, H.265, mm -hmm. which is the current most advanced video codec out of the MPEG folks. And I hear they're starting their work on the next one, whatever it's going to be called. Uh, so a few years down the road, we may have something else. Uh, it allows for spatial scalable coding. So I mentioned this, a base layer at one resolution and an enhancement layer that brings you to a higher resolution. Uh, also support for standard dynamic range, you know, of course, like today. Uh, High dynamic range, we have a couple of different options for this. Uh, standard color, wide color, high frame rate, and high frame rate in a way that's compatible with standard frame rate receivers and displays. So high frame rate's 120 hertz, in the US at least. Uh, and it's using temporal scalability, so it's the same kind of deal. We have a base layer, 60 hertz, and an enhancement layer that gives you information for 120 hertz, and if you have a TV that doesn't do high frame rate, it'll pick the 60 hertz base layer and display that without caring if there's more stuff there. Um, you know, 3D is still hanging around. There's still a couple of people interested. Um, whatever. It's actually really easy. So, uh, you know, all kinks have been worked out. So we just carry it forward. Uh, so, you know, for this, I don't think we need these charts for this room, the, most of the people in the room, but. You know, 4K, uh, more dots, more resolution. Um, well, I'll get to a chart that sort of questions whether how important that is. Uh, HDR, higher dynamic range, more detail in the darks, more detail in the bright areas. Hot, better contrast isn't really the right word for it, but it's impressive. Wider color. Well, we're not using CRTs anymore. We're not limited to what a CRT could do. So we're heading our way out to the real world, but not quite there yet. If you look at all this, the question comes, what are people going to use? You know, broadcasters are going to try all kinds of different things, but I hear more and more that people are talking about transmitting 1080p with high dynamic range, wide color, and where it's appropriate, high frame rate. And one of the reasons is to send 4K, it costs about three times as many bits as HD. That's a lot. If you send high frame rate, maybe 50% more. Sorry. If you send high dynamic range, yeah, 25, 20, 25%. Wider color, 10%, 10 bit color, not much. If you send 1080p, high dynamic range, wider color, 
10 bit. You've cost, cost yourself less than 50% in bits. And you've got a very, very impressive picture. Uh, a lot of studies have been done, uh, Cable Labs, EBU, and a number of others. Random people look at displays, what grabs you, what, what do you like, what gets your attention. Typical screen size, typical viewing distance. 4K rarely got picked out as being interesting. But HDR, color gamut, and for sports type things, those were always called out as those are attractive. That's your improvement. Uh, part of the problem is the typical viewing distance is too far. The screens are too small and your eyes are what they are. Um, nobody ever puts the couch at the right viewing distance for this display size because it looks funny having a couch in the middle of your den. Uh, 4K, you know, it's easy to market because the camera guys taught everybody that more is better. You know, the photo camera guys were selling on how many dots, how many pixels. It's really hard on a conventional SDR TV to market HDR. You can't show it because it's an SDR TV. It's hard to explain to people and they can't quite conceive of it. But if you tell them it's got more dots, they know what it is. What I've heard from a lot of broadcasters is what they're likely to do is create content in 4K, HDR, all the fancy stuff. When they broadcast it, broadcast it in 1080p, HDR, white color, and so on, and let the TV upscale. The <coughs> upscalers and TVs have gotten really, really good, and most people can't tell the difference between 1080p and 4K, where they sit, and their TV size. But they'll see the HDR, the white color, the high frame rate, and go, wow. Because those are the things that really make a big difference in pictures. And we'll see how this evolves, but you know, my, my guess is that's likely to happen. And this is LG. Next Gen TV will mean a whole new viewing experience for over-the-air viewers. Mm -hmm. Consumers have a love affair with 4K Ultra HD. In fact, 15 million sets will be sold in the United States this year. So that gives us a great on-ramp to introduce 4K broadcasting through ATSC 3.0. For broadcasters, having a better picture is one of the tools in their toolkit to really elevate the experience that Next Gen TV will deliver. Oops, I went too far. Okay, audio. A lot of focus was put on audio. Uh, as with video, you know, the codec, codec technologies have not stayed still. Uh, so there are next generation audio systems that have evolved. Uh, what ATSC has chosen is Dolby AC4 and MPEG-H Audio Alliance. Now because of different things, uh, there's a regionalization piece in place where the U.S. will be using, broadcasters in the U.S. will be using primarily Dolby AC4. The systems are similar. It's hard to pick advantages of one over the other. There are some differences. They're both spectacular. There are huge advances in what we have today. Uh, new features. The immersion. Now today, well, we started off with mono, went to stereo, went to 5.1, which is planar surround, surround in a plane. Now we're at typically 7.2 plus 4. Yeah. Uh, so immersion has gotten to be 3D. <coughs> you're hearing stuff not only around you, you're hearing it over. Um, it's impressive. It's really impressive. Uh, key changes besides the 3D is we've moved from just channel-based audio, which is what the older systems use today. You know, Dolby AC3 is 5.1 channels. Uh, new systems using objects. So I have channels available. I have an object. An object has audio characteristics and it has placement characteristics. 
I can move that object around. I can control it. Uh, one simple use, very likely to be used at the beginning, is personalization for sports. People like to watch sports. They have their preferences. I want to hear the home team announcer. I want to hear the away team announcer. I hate announcers. Let me listen to the crowd. Uh, by making the announcers objects, you can give the viewer a control that chooses which object, which announcer to play or not. Really simple. Fits in today's workflow very easily. Uh, and sports fans will really, really like it. Um, other things. Uh, dialogue. I have trouble with a lot of things because the dialogue fades away amongst all the effects, all the music and noises and things. I can't hear people talking. If you could reach out and actually turn the dialogue up a little bit, I'd enjoy it better. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, other object type things. Uh, there are requirements for disability, accessibility. So there's something called um, BI, visually impaired. Um, there's a special audio channel in the name of descriptive video, which is a strange name for an audio channel. But it's for people who are visually impaired, they can't see that well, and it's an audio channel that describes the scene to them. That's required. Uh, the FCC requires that be sent. Today's system is really difficult to do because of the way the plants are, the way the systems are. You almost have to devote, you take away the Spanish channel, put that on, and the people who listen to that don't get the full effects of the other stuff because the mixes aren't the same. So you either have everything, but you don't know what's going on on the screen because you can't see it, or you get told what's going on on the screen, but you lose the other stuff. By having object-based stuff, and you take this descriptive video audio, and you make it an object, you can now mix it in along with everything else, and they get the full experience. And for the broadcaster, it costs very little bandwidth. Besides the fact that the codecs are more efficient, by being able to mix things at will, you can do a lot more stuff with limited bandwidth. Um, so personalization is a big part of it. Uh, where does this go? One of the things today is you almost need different audio mixes for different target devices. If you have you know, episodic television, movies that are aimed at a big screen on the wall with a good sound system, you mix audio a certain way. You take that, play it into a mobile device with a pair of earbuds in a noisy environment, it's awful. You need a totally different mix in the broadcast. Uh, the new systems, next-gen audio systems, are actually rendered at the receiver to the capabilities of the devices. So they'll know, you've got earbuds, I, want, I need to mix it this way. Or I've got a full-blown sound system, I want to do it that way. Or the capability is, um, you know, if you look at today, most homes, they may have a surround sound system, but the speakers are in the wrong place because there's a door where the speaker's supposed to be. Or if the spouse doesn't want the speaker there, it doesn't look nice, put it over there. These new systems are actually able to compensate for that. And they can take into account where the speakers are and render appropriately so it comes out correctly. Um, lots of channels. You know, uh, 7.1 plus 4. Um, and this is where the speakers would normally be located. Not that many people are going to have this many speakers. I was visiting the lab at Qualcomm where they're doing a lot of MPDH work. And I asked the guy there whether his wife would let him put all the speakers in. And his answer was no. But they've moved things far enough that there are sound bars today that will do the entire 7.1 plus 4 experience. So a single soundbar over in front of the screen, you're hearing stuff coming from above and all around you. So the technology has gotten quite advanced. First you had stereo, then you had surround sound with audio coming behind you, and now you have immersive audio with sound overhead. Immersive audio 
brings viewers into the experience. Imagine being inside the stadium or inside the, the arena or hearing sounds all around you when you're listening to a movie or a television program. Instead of having sounds limited to being in front of you or behind you, now you can hear sounds overhead flying by you. And you can hear that not only out of a big home theater system, but you can now get it out of the sound bar, you can get it out of the speakers on your television, or even on your mobile devices. So you get a much more rich, immersive audio experience on every single device. And the thing I find most amazing is you can also get full immersive sound out of a pair of headphones, which is kind of wild. If you, if you haven't experienced this and you get a chance to do it, it's worth it. Uh, interactivity. Uh, interactivity is picking back up again. Um, <clears throat> I've been through a couple of cycles of interactive television. Uh, when I was at IBM Research, they were doing a lot of work with that. Back then, the joke was, you know, the key, uh, the killer app for interactive television was order pizza. Because it seemed to be that's what everybody did was, you know, order pizza app. And I was going to give a talk about a year ago on something or other. And I used that as an example. And like two days before the talk, uh, I forgot, DirecTV or somebody that had put some interactivity in their set-top box, they splashed this new thing, a deal with um, Domino's where you could order pizza from your TV. <laughs> it's like, it kind of died. But um, interactivity is, you know, people are getting used to it. It's no longer pure passive entertainment. People want to interact with stuff. Uh, so key things, um, this is not the first time interactivity has been done in ATSC. Doing it quite differently now. Uh, we made a decision, rather than do things our own way, was to do things the way it was done on the internet base everything on W3C technology as much as possible, use HTML5, uh, and only diverge when the capability didn't exist in the internet. Advantages of things like this is most broadcasters have some kind of a digital, quote, operations going on. They have web presence. They have a bunch of people that are really good at creating content for the web. They can actually take that content and use it directly on TV because it's the same technology. It's a big advantage. Uh, so HTML5, um, you know, overlay graphics, interactivity <laughs> on TV today. If you think of sports, you know, statistics, things like that, it's all done in the TV station. It's burned into the video. Everybody sees the same thing. This is all stuff being generated on the TV and an application on the TV. What I see may be totally different than what you see, depending on what your preferences are, what you asked them to do, what app you called up. Uh, so, you know, ad insertion actually is part of the interactive feature. It's an application that's doing this kind of thing. Uh, second screen. Uh, second screen may come back. Uh, one possibility is you're getting different languages of what's going on in the second screen if you have kids. Kids are fighting over what happens on the screen. Well, if they each have their own little tablet, they can do their own thing. And you have peace and quiet for a change for a little while. Um, simple interactivity, the immersive audience I measured. <coughs> Content can be streamed in real time. One thing I haven't really mentioned much is the capability of pushing content to a TV in advance, storing it, and then consuming it when it's needed. It's been part of these standards for a while. Uh, today, the capabilities are going to be much more realizable because the TVs have more processing power, they have storage. Uh, so you can cache it, you can deliver real-time, you can deliver non-real-time, you can deliver over broadcast, you can deliver over broadband and mix all this stuff together. So the interactivity environment is based on W3C technologies along with the web as much as possible. Uh, you should be able to adapt web apps for TV use and vice versa. Um, when I talked earlier about the segmented delivery, one of the consequences of that is you can use the same content for a streaming OTT service as you do for over the air. You may not need all the representations, but you can now start reusing content over these different delivery mechanisms. There are some TV-centric functions that W3C doesn't do. Um, you know, web browser never needs to change the channel. It just doesn't make sense. 
uh, parental control. That's still part of television. It's not part of the web. So being able to deal with that. Uh, PVR. Um, this is starting to creep into the web, but it's not done all that well. Uh, timed events in the program. If you're doing interactivity, or you're doing some simple things like putting captions on the screen, it's got to be synchronized. It's got to be tightly synchronized with timing in the event. Uh, W3C, up to now, hasn't done very good at that because they haven't needed to. They are starting to work on it, and there may be a solution that works for both. But these are all additions, but other than that, it's based on essentially W3C. Now, there's a side effect of this. Broadcasters, people in the TV industry are used to standards staying still for a long time. They change slowly. If you look at web standards, they change fast. So learning how to be agile like that is part of what's happening in TV technology today. So ATSC3, hybrid, it's, it's a big thing. I keep on bringing it up. Uh, the viewers are there. They're going to get stuff off broadcast. They're going to get stuff off live TV, off the internet. Uh, new business models for broadcasters are going to evolve all, out of all of this. Don't know what they are yet. People still have to get their heads wrapped around it and start thinking, but it's almost guaranteed there's going to be some very interesting new models that appear. You know, the simple-minded things, the things that everybody's thought about forever. Uh, interactivity, quiz, you know, you see this kind of, you even see this in the movie theater now, but you don't get a chance to reach out and click. Uh, and of course, everybody's going to find a way to advertise. Everything is based on money comes from advertising and television. Uh, so simple interactive quizzes, uh, additional information, the familiar L bar with all kinds of stuff. Uh, shopping, you know, the ability to reach out. It's a two-way system. Uh, being able to watch something and go to some e-commerce location based on TV and buy stuff. People are going to experiment with this. The capabilities are all there. Accessibility, important stuff. Uh, besides that the FCC requires it, it's the right thing to do. Uh, there's people that have hearing problems, there's people that have visual problems. You want to be able to give entertainment to them. So there's really strong support for all of this in ATSC 3.0. Uh, caption services, I mentioned the use of a more robust PLP for audio and captioning. Uh, audio intelligibility for hearing impaired, being able to turn up dialogue, use object-based stuff. Um, track specific volume control, video descriptive services, uh, the descriptive video I mentioned before. Uh, so for visually impaired, we have video description. For hearing impaired, we have closed captions. And by the way, captions are done more like it's being done in the internet, SMPT time text, or more specifically IMSC1, which is a variant of that. Uh, but since there's a lot of carriage and cable, the old uh, SEI-based 609 and 709 are still being used. Uh, closed signing is being looked at. A little video inset with someone actually doing sign interpretation of what's being said. Uh, and then dialogue intelligibility is a key factor. Uh, emergency alerting. Uh, we still have the requirements that emergency alerts have got to be burned into the video. The text crawl and then an audio track that uh, puts that into audio is still required. But there's capability for a new system, advanced emergency alerting, which is a very robust way to get emergency information to the public if something happens. Um, it's a broadcast system. It reaches everybody. Broadcast television stations uh, have been hardened for a long time. I've been on tours and guy running the station is always showing off his generators and you know these things are meant to withstand all kinds of problems and typically in big hurricanes they're still operating. Uh, so one of the main roles of broadcasters is public information provider. Uh, during emergencies you know the cell systems if they're working get congested. People are calling are you okay and so on. Broadcasting is still reaching out and reaching people. 
Uh, and it's a lot of stations, this is what they want to do. They're, they have a relationship with their viewers, their community. And they want to get information out on weather, public service, and so on. So the advanced emergency alerting feature goes beyond the text crawl and the messaging. It's the capability of carrying rich media in the broadcast. First off, it can wake up receivers. I mentioned that earlier with the wake up functions. And in all receivers, it can carry text, it can carry videos, it can carry audios, it can carry maps. Um, so many receivers know where they are, not all, but many do, and you can actually target alerts. So if you have a tornado situation, which is going to go down the west side of the city, you don't have to scare everybody on the east side who really don't care. You can have the receivers on the west side wake up and start giving the warning. Uh, so geotargeting is a strong possibility. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, things like weather radar, evacuation routes, live news, weather reporting instructions, what to do before and after are all part of it. Um, typically, there's going to be some kind of a menu interactivity. The viewer can choose what to see. Uh, content can be integrated with the video. Uh, carry graphics that are useful. Um, I don't know why I threw this in. It's a little bit more technical than the rest of it. But the emergency alerting syntax is loosely based on the CAP. Um, which is the standardized XML emergency alerting format, uh, but really gets the broadcast related information. Who gets the information? When is it valid? Where is it appropriate? Some kind of a narrative, a textual description, and pointers to uh, the media resources, and cases where there may be live media, so there may be actually a live broadcast on another virtual channel, and this can point you over to that. I think this is my last video clip. A warn is the advanced warning and response network. If you over alert people, people become immune for alert. So they, they, they ignore them. It's just another noise in the background. With ATSC 3.0, we can use geotargeting to send that alert to just the area of the BMA that needs that alert. The beauty of ATSC 3 means that we can send that over the air and that we're not relying on a connection to the internet or a connection to 5G or, or LTE. Okay, so security. Uh, security, you know, it's kind of ignored it for a long time, but came to realize it's a big deal. Uh, TV sets can be hacked. There's actually been more and more occurrences of man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading in Britain, somebody has been breaking into one of the FM broad radio broadcasts and playing some naughty songs. The problem is the kids are humming these songs and their parents are getting really annoyed. They're just overpowering the broadcast. But it is possible in a small area to actually break into a digital TV broadcast and put something in. Uh, so the broadcast itself, you've got to worry about. Another part is now we're broadband. We've got interactivity. We've got stuff that may actually involve money changing hands. This is like the internet. Um, run, you know, go install Windows on a computer without any security. Let it sit on the internet for a couple of days, see what happens. Our TVs are going to get like that. So the ability to deal with security risks, to talk about when I do broadband interactive connections using secure mechanisms, HTTPS, TLS, things like that. They're all part of this. Uh, broadcasters may want to control access to their content. It may not be for a fee. There are freemium models. Uh, one of the possibilities that's been mentioned is, you know, broadcasters want to collect information about viewers. There's privacy concerns. It probably needs to be an opt-in. Why would people opt in? Well, one 
thing I've heard from some people is saying, I've got plenty, I've got content. I've got better content. If you opt in to me anonymously monitoring some simple things, I'll unlock the premium content for you. There are models like that that can make sense. So the need for conditional access, the need for digital rights management is there in the broadcast world. Being able to do it in a broadcast mode to smart TVs, being able to standardize how to do that so everybody can make use of it, that's important. So this group is actually working on that kind of stuff. It's not only the, you know, the nasty security aspects, it's also the conditional access and so on. So, documents. Uh, that's the list of all the standards in the ATSC suite. Uh, we started using a skyscraper notion because my drawings looked ugly. And somebody who was actually good at graphics put this together. Uh, there's 21 documents. Um, that's a snapshot as of today, but the draft, the draft is the only one not publicly available. That today got approved to go for ballot as a candidate standard, so it will become publicly available. Um, everything else is in the process of moving downwards towards completion. Um, I'll predict that these will all be done end of the year. So I think the ATSC3 standards will be essentially complete by the end of this year. And of course, I have to show this caveat, you know, subject to change, yada, yada. Uh, with that, South Korea has launched commercially ATSC 3.0. These are the four major broadcasters in Korea. Uh, Korea is having an Olympics in early 2018. I forgot the exact date. And the government gave these four broadcasters a six megahertz channel to put 4K UHD coverage of the Olympics on the air commercially. They're on the air, it's working. They're using the ATSC3 standard. If you go into a store in Korea, you can buy an ATSC3 UHD television off the shelf from at least two different manufacturers. Uh, so they're ahead of us, and it's looking good. You know, of course, there were some growing pains, but the system works. You're in the Yeah, there was actually a board, ATSC board tour, and I got into some. I was on the tour, so I got into some and not the others. It was really impressive to see. The, they were all building new studios for uh, UHD. Really, really impressive. Very nice work there. Uh, this is actually, I think I stole this from NAB Pilot, but it's a chart of uh, what's involved in deploying ATSC 3.0 to a television station. Uh, so we've got a bunch of existing components that are still usable for in a 3.0 world. Uh, we've got ones that are this color, which are may need upgrade. They may be okay, depending on what's going on. And, uh, what is that, salmon color? Uh, this is all new stuff. So you'll see there are some pieces of the station that stay the same. There's a bunch of new things. There's things that need changing. Um, one thing that was maybe fortuitous is there was the auction that took place, and now there's a repack process that's taking place where broadcasters have to move into a narrower brand, band of frequencies. Uh, they are being reimbursed somewhat for the cost of making the changes. The reimbursement does not cover, it is for ATSC-1 equipment that they need to purchase to make the change in frequency and so on. It does not cover 3.0 only equipment but the broadcasters can buy equipment that is either 3.0 ready or upgradable to 3.0 at minimal cost. So instead of having to do this twice, they can sort of do it once. We're lucky that everything sort of lined up in time. Uh, it's not, I don't have any cost estimates as to what it'll take to change a station from 1.0 to 3.0. It's not outrageous. 
Uh, there's also the question of how do you do a transmission? Because everybody is out there, if they have broadcast capable TVs, they're 1.0. 3.0 TVs will hit the market. Broadcasters will have to go on air first, or else you have a real problem with TVs getting bought and they don't do anything, so they get returned. Um, but how do you cover all of the TVs that are out there now? And there's people experimenting with different things. You know, there's the old um, plug yeah. converter box, set-top box, 3.0 tuner that plugs in. Uh, there's an interesting notion that people are experimenting with, which is a gateway device. A device that has a 3.0 tuner, may have a transcoder, it may not. And it puts the 3.0 received signal onto the Wi-Fi network in the home. And a smartphone, Wi-Fi connected, a tablet, Wi-Fi connected, a smart TV, Wi-Fi connected, now becomes an ATSC 3.0 device. That's very likely. Those devices are not going to be very expensive, and I've seen prototypes from them already. On the broadcast side, we have the, that transition. Um, the FCC is in the process of approving ATSC 3.0 transmissions. It's looking positive. The indications are it'll happen pretty soon. Nothing's 100% guaranteed. It's voluntary for the broadcasters. It'll probably be regional. Broadcasters are likely to cooperate, which we're in a new world, uh, where they will get together and simulcast. So simple-minded way of looking at it is do broadcasters get together? They have two towers. One tower is shared for 1.0 transmission, half for each. The other tower is 3.0, half for each. And you have coverage of 1.0 and 3.0 in the same area, so you get a graceful transition. More realistic scenario is more broadcasters getting together. And at the start, having 3.0 on one stick, limited service, because there aren't that many TVs out there, and you keep a lot of the 1.0. And over time, phase it over as 3.0 grows in the market. 3.0 transmissions become dominant, and the 1.0 becomes sort of the um, uh, the holdout. Exactly what's going to happen, we're going to see. Uh, that's not what ATSC does. There's other groups looking at how this works. Uh, but I think there are plausible scenarios that will actually work. Summary, and one thing I didn't mention is ATSC3 is not backwards compatible, so a 1.0 receiver will not receive ATSC3. That was by choice. Um, if a transition is needed, you better go have significant improvements. If you made it backwards compatible, you would not be able to get significant improvements, and it would have made a transition questionable. Uh, it really acknowledges the changes in environment. Uh, it really plays into the issues with spectrum. Uh, it supports new business models for broadcasters. And it's flexible. I think this system will actually be able to evolve over time without having to make, make huge transitions. And with that, I'll go for questions.